Good morning. So many wrong things in that clip. Don't have time to address them all, but since we're talking about baptism today, I thought, what baptism clip could I use from a movie? So here's what's funny. Ricky gets up this morning, and uh, I'm drinking my coffee, and all of a sudden I hear, come on, brothers, let's go down. I'm like, what in the world? So anyway, so here's the deal about baptism. So People have already asked me this question, so I want to address this question first as we talk about, and we're going to start in uh, Luke chapter 3. Luke, Dr. Luke, we like to call him, doctor of his time, was the only book of the Bible not written by a disciple of Jesus. Uh, and so there's your trivia question. Next time you're on Jeopardy, you might get that one. Uh, anyway, because it's one that's just, just true. So, um, but he was a contemporary of Paul. Paul talks about him. And then uh, Timothy, most likely. And of course, uh, Peter and a few others. And he gathered the stories. And instead of starting in chapter 1, we're going to start in chapter 3 today and talk about baptism. And we're talking first about John the Baptist's baptism, which was before Christ's death. And so, uh, uh, anyone who, by the way, anyone who was baptized before Christ got baptized again when they became Christians because John's baptism is called a baptism of repentance. And what repentance means is a change of mind. And basically, they were preparing, and we're going to show that, for what was coming next. A baptism as a Christian, which we do here, is basically the wedding ring of the Christian life. It's a demonstration that you have surrendered your life to Christ. Now, I want you today, as we talk about this idea of repentance, we're going to talk a little bit about baptism just in the context but I want you to think of, as we say, how to prepare for Christ in you, all three of these points, I want you to think about this idea of surrender. Um, because if, if one word can sum up the Christian life, it's the idea of surrender. We tend to like control. We tend to like things to go. We tend to like to tell God what his rules should be. And all those, and that goes so well. And, uh, and that's nothing new in society. So, uh, I'm going to give you a couple of secrets. So here's the secret to a great lawn. What is this called? What? Aerator or aeration or putting some holes in your dang yard, right? Right? Did I say dang? Am I allowed to say that in church? Okay. So, so this obviously hooks to my lawnmower. I'm not walking around with this on a stick or anything and uh, uh, pull it behind my lawnmower, and I will tell you that my yard uh, uh, was dirt when we first got our yard. I mean, literally just sand, and also hard pan, which is where it's never been plowed, and we still have some areas of hard pan. I have to take a pick, and, and, and I mean, you can take a pickaxe and hit it as hard as you can, and it'll bounce off of there. It is crazy. I never knew that. In Miami, we didn't have that. We just had coral rock, almost the same. So, speaking of Miami, if you're a Gator fan, I'm, I'm so sorry. I know by the end of the season, they'll fire your coach, and then they'll say, it's all going to be better now. That's what they do in college. That's the kind of the thing. Anyway, so uh, we're finally, hopefully, getting rid of the Shalala curse. But, um, sorry, did I say all that out loud? Some of that was meant to stay inside. So, uh, here's the thing. This is kind of the secret ingredient that a lot of people don't know because here's the thing. You can throw fertilizer, you can water, you can do all those things. And the truth is, if there's not room for seed to sink into the soil, you won't have any growth. Now, as a Christian, repentance, forgiveness, confession are, are those, that's the secret ingredient for a joyful Christian life. And what's interesting about it is when we talk about those things, nobody says repentance and joy, except in Luke chapter 3, where John the Baptist is going to talk about this baptism of repentance and basically saying, I'm changing my mind. I can't do things on my own. By the way, can you imagine me walking around my uh, uh, one and a half acre yard with a screwdriver and trying to make all these holes? That's like trying to live life in your own power. We need the power of Christ. We can't do this on our own. Even the idea of repentance, we need Him to make the change in us. So today we're going to talk about how to prepare for Christ in you. And here, listen, repentance, asking forgiveness, all those things are really the secret 
of a joyful Christian life. I know it doesn't seem like it because when you hear the word repentance, when you, when you hear the word confession, you tend to think of these negative thoughts, but you don't understand that it really has to do with you can't do it on your own. And so when you confess, and we're, we're going to get there and we're going to talk about it a little bit. So no matter how good you seed, no how, how good you fertilize your water, without preparation, nothing happens. Remember, Jesus talked about the, the seeds. You know, some were choked out by worries. And but some of you this morning can't even concentrate on what I'm saying because you're worried about something. Okay? And sometimes you just have to say, God, I give that worry to you, that person, that situation, right? So... Today we're going to talk about repentance, being authentic, and being humble. And all of these go with that idea of confession, of being honest with God, of repenting of where we're at. So let's pick up this story. Number one, repent and receive forgiveness. It's two parts, not one, and I'm going to tell you why in a second. Here we go. Uh, talking about John the Baptist, and we pick up in Luke chapter 3. We're starting off our series here. By the way, you know why we're starting in chapter 3? Because in December, there's some kind of thing that we celebrate and typically we read chapter 1 and 2. So I thought instead of reading it now and then a couple of months from now reading it again, that we would just start in chapter 3 and then go back. I figured you could handle that. Most of you. Josh, maybe not. But everybody else, Josh said he'd get it. All right, here we go. So he went into all the country around the Jordan, the Jordan River, uh, um, kind of, if you want to think about it, think about one of the springs uh, how many of you ever been to the springs somewhere in the central Florida? Uh, that's how Venetian pool in Miami feels, exactly like that. That's where I learned to swim as a kid. Uh, it's like 50 degrees year-round in Miami, which is 90 degrees year-round. So that is a miserable place to learn to swim. All right. So he went into all the country around the Jordan preaching, listen to this, a baptism of repentance. Now, what does repentance mean? We, we put all kind of baggage on that, but repentance really means uh, a, a change of mind. It has to do with our mind and changing. And by the way, the, the key to any change in your life is to first change your mind, to change how you think about it. You know, it's like people uh, uh, all the time go on diets and they start eating salads, right? Because they want to lose weight. But then they're using dressing. And then one day they look at the back of the bottle of dressing Maybe, how many, come on, you've done this, right? You look at the bottle of dressing, back of the dressing, and you're like, that's a Big Mac. I just ate a Big Mac, right? And so you do one of two things. You either change dressing or you go to a Big Mac. It's up to you, right? And it's true, right? We've put things on our, and so what is that? Repentance is, whoa, I got it. This is not working. Why, why am I gaining weight eating salads? Well, because you're pouring calories. You're pouring a Big Mac on your salad and wonder why, you know. And by the way, you're not supposed to use potato chips as croutons, just so you know. It's in the rule book. All right, sorry. He went into all the country around the Jordan preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And this word for forgiveness is cool too. It means to release from bondage. It's this idea that you're trapped. And we all know that feeling where we have a hurt or a habit and it seems to haunt us. I actually talked to a friend just recently that's haunted from their childhood. And for good reason, they had some awful, awful, I can't even imagine what they walked through. But here's what I know about Jesus. He can heal even that. So whatever you've walked through, whatever you've been through, whatever you've traveled through, what's he doing? Repentance, he's going to change our minds, and he's going to give us forgiveness, that freedom and forgiveness, not only of our bondage, but of sin, which is amazing. And then it continues, as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah, the prophet, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. So Isaiah, hundreds of years before, is prophesying what he's going to do, and then it says, uh, make straight the paths for him. Every valley shall be filled in. Every mountain and hill made low. The crooked roads shall become straight. The rough way smooth. And all the people will see God's salvation. So here Dr. Luke is giving us some details about what happened before Jesus' baptism. Where John the Baptist, his cousin. By the way, if you don't know who John the Baptist is. He's the one that jumped in the belly of Elizabeth. He's the, he's the one that when Jesus showed up, was, was already ready to go. Woo! It's ADD to start, right? And so John the Baptist is also the one that is here preaching. He's preaching to uh, uh, not only 
people who are Gentiles, which was a big deal, by the way. He's preaching to Gentiles, but also to the Jewish leaders who thought they had their act together. Now, if you think re repentance is just a John the Baptist thing, listen to what in Matthew 4, it talks about what Jesus preached, and here it is. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, listen, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Now, so you don't tie all your baggage to that word, repent. Here's what I want you to think of when you see that. Change your mind. God's right here. Change your mind. God's right here. One of the things I encourage you to do if you're struggling in any area of your life is to surrender. Sometimes the only way we make a change in our lives is when we finally give up. Sometimes the only way we humble ourselves, we, we kind of come to the end of what we think is the best thing to do, is to finally go, I can't do it. And I think so often when we say, I can't do it, God's like, finally. Like you hadn't figured that out. One of the things I want to encourage you to do when it comes to repentance, when it comes to changing your mind, is take some time every day. Listen, this is going to sound weird. Take some time every day. You ready? To repent. To say, God, examine my mind. Like David said, let, see if there's any wayward way in me. God, is there a way I'm thinking about something that's not the way you think about something? And if we're honest, sometimes it's a person in our lives. Maybe it's somebody you work with that you think less of. You think you're smarter than. You think you're greater than. Like if you had the little equal sign thing, you'd be like, not equal, better than. I'm better than that person who posted their political belief online. I'm not, right? No, you're not. And so sometimes we have to say to God, God, you know my heart. God, examine my heart. The Bible says the Holy Spirit. If you're a Christian, you have the Holy Spirit in you. When we get baptized, we get baptized with the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? So when you give your life to Christ, He gives you the Holy Spirit. Why? To convict you of sin and of righteousness. So he points out when our thought process is wrong, when our thinking is wrong about people, about things, about situations, and we repent, we say, God, thank you for changing my mind. Now, Lord, help me to do what's right. Lord, help me to treat that person like a child loved by God. More important than any of those other things. Lord, help me to love the people that I don't like. Boy, that's one of the hardest ones, right? You're related to some of them. Don't point at your spouse today. So, so here's what I want you to do. Every day at some point, whether it's in the morning or night or both, take some time and say, God, would you examine my heart? Show me, show me anything where I need to repent. I need to change my mind. That's what confession is. And Lord, I confess. And here's the thing. Then you receive his forgiveness. And this is where the danger is for many people. Because we're so used to beating ourselves up. we either one extreme to the other. We're either prideful or we're... Woe is me. But here's the good news. You confess your sins, which puts you in the right state of humility, and then you receive his forgiveness. You, you, you realize, I didn't do it on my own. I, I didn't poke all the holes. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't go out with my screwdriver. Lord, I can't do it, but thank you that you have forgiven me. And see, that puts you in the right attitude because you recognize other people, you know, people, they're the same way. They need him too. And so we could say, but for the grace of God, I would be just like that person. But for the grace of God, I might do those very things that other person was doing. But God, you're so good. Thank you for forgiving me. Lord, thank you for forgiving that thought that I had. Now, here's the thing. Here's the danger. Don't camp in your sin because then it becomes selfishness. Confession can actually become selfishness when you just say, God, forgive me, God, forgive me, God, forgive me. You say the same thing over and over again. It's just useless. Do you really trust him to forgive you? God, thank you that you forgive me. And so you confess it and then you receive and be thankful. By the way, I encourage you to be specific with your sins. Let God convict you specifically. Don't just say, God, forgive me for sinning. You want him to convict you. Why? So that you can make changes. And how do you make changes? With the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, I need your power. Number two, be authentic and sharing. Let me show you what this looks like if you're an authentic person. I bought an orange tree. Uh, Home Depot or Lowe's, I don't remember which one. On it was a little tag, navel orange tree. And I went, oh, 
I love navel orange trees. I'm planting that in my yard. As soon as we got the house, planted the orange tree, fertilized the orange tree, watered the orange tree. Year one, nothing. Year two, nothing. Year three, little orange. I was like, oh. Oh, that must be the rootstock. You know, one limb is the rootstock, I thought. It's the rootstock. Next year, 10 oranges. I'm like, oh, can't wait. I'm like, wait a second. These aren't navel oranges. Pull the orange, juice oranges. Terrible oranges. So now I have a big old six-year-old gross orange tree in my yard that's perfect for kids throwing them at each other. And that's what it's used for now. When we juice them, we just throw them at other children. I mean, I don't. Well, maybe. But, but not recently. Why? Because it's the wrong kind of orange. It's not what it was supposed to be. It told me navel. And guess what? Not. There's a lot of people saying they're Christians. A lot of people say, I've given my life to Jesus Christ. But here's the deal. It's the truth in the fruit. Does the way you live have the fruit of the Spirit, love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and faithfulness, and I don't like the last one, self-control. Would somebody accuse you of any of those things? So John says this, so John said to the crowds, coming to be baptized by him. By the way, the way this paragraph starts and ends is awesome. He looks at the crowd and he says, you brood of vipers. Can you imagine coming to church and that's the first thing out of my mouth to you? Welcome, snakes. Great to see you this morning, right? How do you, where do you, right? So he says, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Basically, you've come out here to the countryside. Who warned you? And then he says, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones, God could raise up children for Abraham. So there were religious leaders who said, well, well, we're grafted in because Abraham's our father. By the way, in the Old Testament, the Jews did the same thing. They thought that the ark was going to save them. So there was one time they were far from God. They took the ark into battle. And guess what? They not only lost, they lost the ark. So the truth is, it's not about your heritage. It's not about your parents went to church. It's not about my parents were this, my parents were that. He says, hey, God can raise up Christians from anywhere. By the way, he's talking to Jews at this point, but you get the idea. Then he says, the axe is already at the root of the trees. Every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. Now, you're going to be surprised at the last sentence after that sentence. What should we do then, the crowd asked. John answered, anyone who has two shirts should share with one that has none. Anyone who has food should do the same. Even, I love this, even tax collectors came to be baptized. By the way, tax collectors were politicians of that time. They were Jews who worked for the Roman government. They were politicians. So it's like, it'd be like today saying, even congressmen came to be saved. And women, I didn't mean to leave congresswomen out. Teacher, they asked, what should we do? Don't collect any more than you're required to do. He didn't tell him to quit his job. He said, do it the right way. If God's put you in that position, stay in that position, but do it the way you're supposed to. And then he says, uh, then some soldiers asked him, what should we do? And he replied, get rid of the Roman. No. He said, don't extort money. Don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. Now, what's he doing? He's saying, if... The fruit, if you've really repented, if you've really changed your mind, then what you do is going to show. So the question for all of us is what it says in 1 John. Are you walking in the light? Are you doing what God's called you to do? Or are you walking your own way? If you're continuing to do sin, continuing to follow your own path, doing whatever you want to do, and then saying, but I'm a Christian, I would encourage you. Time to repent. Because you're going to lose love. And joy and peace. If you're a believer, the fruit of the Spirit doesn't grow in bad soil. So you have to say, God, would you turn up the soil in me? In Hebrews 13, it says this, Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually, listen to this, offer up to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name. And don't forget to do good, to share with others, for with such sacrifices, God is pleased. So what happens? As you recognize all that God has given you, when you recognize the blessings in your life, guess what? You quit focusing so much on yourself, 
And you start noticing people around you that need help. You start noticing needs. You start noticing others. It's, life is not just about you anymore. And because you've praised the Lord, you've said, God, thank you for all you've done, for all you've given me, for all that I have. Then you begin to, God begins to put people on your heart. Maybe you should check on that person. Maybe you should help that person. Maybe you should go visit that person. Maybe you should bring that person soup. Maybe you should see how that person's doing. And God will put people on your heart. Why? Because that is the service that he calls us to do. So this week, say, God, how can I be a blessing? Every day you should say, God, help me notice the people around me. Because just like I told the children, you guys know that one was for you, right? We have to embrace the moments. Why? Because we start thinking life is about the next thing. The next place to get to, the next traffic light, the next I-95 drive, the next job that I have, the next problem that I have, the next plumber I have to call, the next roofer I have to call, the next somebody had to call an AC guy. They were telling me that story last night. The next whatever, we tend to think life's about that instead of stopping where we are and embracing the moments and the people that God's put in our lives. When's the last time you've embraced these people? I don't even mean physically. I mean, when's the last time you really went out of your way? Ask them how they were doing. And listen to what they said, all my ADD friends. Christine Kane says this, God's preparing you for the thing he has prepared for you. I love that. Number three, humble yourself and point to Jesus. So if you came by my house and I was in my yard with a screwdriver... You'd say, Eric, what's the matter? It's just been such a long... Right? You'd know I was crazy. I've lost it. Or maybe I would say, well, my lawnmower's not broken. Is my lawnmower's broken? And you'd probably look at me and go, uh, fix the lawnmower. You will never finish that. And here's the truth about sin in our lives and repentance in our lives. We can't do it on our own. God, I need your help. This whole idea of surrender when you start your day, when you end your day of saying, God, I can't do this on my own. God, on my own, I'm a failure. God, on my own, I'm... <laughs> now listen to what happens next. The people were waiting expectantly, all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Messiah. John answered them all, I baptize with water, but the one who's more powerful than I will come, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. Now, I don't mean to be gross, but I know you won't catch what he's saying here, so I want to be gross. And if you've been to Disney World where they have the brown sidewalk in, in, uh, in uh, Frontierland, did you know that they did that on purpose? Because if you grew up in the Midwest, or excuse me, in the Wild West, it was like Back to the Future 3, where Marty jumps in manure. There was manure everywhere. There were animals everywhere. We don't even realize how clean our shoes are today compared to what they would have been walking in Roman streets with Roman animals everywhere. Even if the Romans made the roads, and they did, they elevated the roads, and they'd be all, you'd still have to go take care of your animal. So you were walking in dirt and, yes. And guess what would happen if your shoelace got untied during those days? Oh, no. John looks at the people and says, I'm not even worthy to untie stinky, dirty, gross sandal string laces, shoelaces. And then he continues. Untie, by the way, not even tie, untie. I'm not even allowed to go, eh. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Fire And many other words John exhorted the people, and listen, listen to what it says, and proclaimed the good news to them. Wait a second. Brood of vipers, your fruit stinks, he's coming with a winnowing fork, good news. What? You know why it's good news? Because you can't do any of these things on your own. And so when John says somebody's coming 
who's more powerful than me. The Holy Spirit is coming. Why? Because in order for us to have the power to live the Christian life, to live the way God wants us to do, guess what? The good news is Christ died for us and lives in us as believers so that we can overcome. So how do we overcome? Repentance. Confession. Asking the Holy Spirit to empower our lives. Asking God to impact what we do, what we say, how we think. That's first, by the way. And in the next few verses, it talks about how Jesus then was baptized. Just a couple verses there, it says, when all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. In Philippians 2, it says this, Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place, gave him the name that's above every name, at the name of Jesus. Every knee should bow in heaven, on earth, under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. When you recognize your weakness, when you recognize your failures, when you repent of the mistakes, the failures, the wrong ways of thinking, the wrong things of doing, you start to be humble in yourself. But here's what's awesome. When you recognize what Jesus has done for you, you begin to lift him up. You begin to point to him. You begin to realize that without him, it's nothing. That you can't do this on your own. You don't even break up the ground. You don't even repent well. You read a verse of the Bible and forgot it before you walked out the door. Before you set your Bible down. And so the truth is, Holy Spirit, we need your help. No matter how good the seed is in your life, without preparation, you won't be ready. So practice repentance this week. Practice confession. Practice lifting him up and knowing that you need his help this week. Surrender to him in all things. And guess what? You'll find the joy of the Christian life that maybe you're missing lately. Because he's going to change your mind. He's helping you to repent. Helping you to change who you are. What you do. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, you can do that today. I'd love to talk to you after the service about what it means to be a Christian. And you can surrender to him today. Maybe you're here and you're a Christian, but there's some areas of your life that you're hanging on to. Boy, you're you're going to be in control one way or the other. One of the things about baptism is it's a sign of letting go. You're letting a pastor (laughs) dunk you underwater. Baptism is just an outward sign of what's going on in your heart. You're letting go of your own way of doing things and surrendering it to God. Dying to yourself and living for him. Maybe as a Christian, the truth is there's some areas where you're living for yourself. Just be honest confess. If you're watching online, you can send us a prayer request. We'd love to talk to you. And if you're here, I'd love to talk to you after the service. Let's close in prayer today. Father, thank you for this time together. Thank you for your word, your love for us. Father, thank you for the good news, not only of confession, but of forgiveness. And so, Lord, I pray that we could walk in your forgiveness, that we could walk in your love. Father, I pray that you would help us as we Surrender all areas of our lives to you. Father, thank you for these moments together. In Jesus' name, amen.